Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books and Political Science, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Susan Lee Bell at St. Joseph's University, and today I'm joined by Dr. Danigal Goldthwaite Young to discuss her new book, Wrong How Media, Politics, and Identity Drive Our Appetite for Misinformation, published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2023. Over the past 40 years, lawmakers in America's two major political parties have taken increasingly extreme positions on ideological issues. Voters from the two parties have become increasingly distinct and hostile to one another along the lines of race, religion, geography, and culture. In Wrong, Goldthwait Young illustrates how political leaders and media organizations capitalize on social and cultural identities to separate, enrage, and mobilize people. Because humans are motivated to comprehend, to feel in control, and to be part of a community, they seek information that satisfies these needs, including misinformation that favors their political team. They don't want to be wrong. Bringing together tools from political science, communications, and social psychology, Dr. Young creates a model to explain how public officials, journalists, and social media platforms encourage what she calls identity distillation. Dr. Young both describes the dynamics and provides suggestions for how to disrupt identity-driven wrongness. These include journalists abandoning conflict framing in the coverage of politics, social media platforms increasing transparency about their algorithmic content rankings and ad targeting, and individuals cultivating intellectual humility and disrupting performances of political identity to increase the demand for democracy-centered political information. Dr. Danica Goldthwaite Young is a professor of communications and political science at the University of Delaware. Her areas of expertise include political media effects, media psychology, public opinion, and the psychology of misinformation. I am delighted to welcome her to the New Books Network. Thank you so much for having me, Susan. Uh, It's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. And thank you for the terrific graphic that explains the argument right before you even begin the book. I'm so glad that you appreciate the graphic. I, I, I insisted that I wanted, so, I'm, I, I love visual representations of processes, and I really wanted the reader to constantly be able to come back and recenter themselves in that model to recognize it's all working together. And if it's all working together, then it's disruptable. Um. I loved where it was placed because I actually read it first, and then I went back and marked it up. So, so it, it it provided something to sort of frame it at the beginning, and also a point of reference along the way. So, good good arguing to get that to get that in there. Okay, so a lot of people are focusing on misinformation, like the supplying of the inaccurate information, but. Actually, you're not focused on that. You're focused on how individuals take this in, on like their being wrong and why it is they do this and it not being because they're bad people or they're stupid, but that there's something else going on and you're trying to sort of get at that. So um, let's start with that, the, the sort of the problem that you see, the title that you pick of this notion of being wrong. Being wrong. Yeah. So uh, I could not have written this book without all of the work that's already out there on that supply side of misinformation, because we all know, and it happens all the time. I just ran into several pieces of misinformation today, um, that there is an abundance of false information that is shared online. Even news organizations share information that is false. Propagandists share information that they know to be false, that what we call disinformation. And the people even that we love and respect will often spread or share directly to us or on social media false information. Um, The question is, what is going on on the side of what I call demand. And that's not to say that we as individuals demand lies. I want to be lied to. It's it's more subtle than that. We don't demand to be lied to. What we do is we, we crave information that satisfies some fundamental needs. 
what I call the three C's. Those are our needs to feel like we comprehend the world, feel like we have control over it, and feel that we're connected to community. So comprehension, control, and community. And to the extent that information satisfies those needs, whether or not it's empirically accurate is sort of besides the point. Um, And that's a, a hard thing for folks to you know, reconcile, like, really, I don't want to be accurate. Most of us actually don't. Um, And I think what's important about looking at this side of our appetite for these falsehoods is that it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't even require that there be false information to which we are directly exposed in order for us to have empirically false beliefs. A lot of times we fill in the blanks. We're invited to put things together in ways that give us comprehension, control, and community, but lead us to believe things that are empirically false, even if no one has told us an all-out fabrication. We fill in the blanks with the misinformation on our own. Um, So that's kind of where I start, because I think it's important for us to recognize that what some are considering the misinformation crisis doesn't only reside on the side of the information landscape itself. And and if that were the case, I think you're arguing later in the book, then we wouldn't be able to disrupt it as easily um, because we wouldn't see our own role in it. And and I want to point out that the book is divided into these sort of two halves. Uh, The first part is focused on people, as as you're explaining right now, looking at, you know, where does wrongness come from? and, And And you do a really terrific job of not pointing fingers. In fact, you point fingers at yourself. And that's how you came to this. You understand that anyone can be uh, subject to these desires to make sense of their world. And so, as you put it in chapter one, people like us believe these things. And I think that really provides an incredible framework to the book because From the get-go, you kind of have to stop yourself from saying like, oh yeah, I'm going to read about the other people who make mistakes. You immediately, through your own candor about yourself, put the reader in that position of, oh wait, I do this too. Um, Yeah, I'm so glad that that you saw that and appreciated that because you know, that gets to why I wrote it in the first place and why I wrote it in the voice that I did. Um, In the early days of COVID, when there was a lack of information and people were really, we all felt upside down and people were sharing information that was false, um, sometimes sharing misinformation that had been deliberately created uh, to spread false information. But some people were also just asking questions and saying, well, I think this and I think that, right? Coming to their own false conclusions, but also putting it out there and saying, do we think that this might be right? What do we think of this? Like, let's try this on for size. What do we think? Um, and it got me thinking, because a lot of those thoughts, actually, a lot of those posts were very conspiratorial in nature, the the notion that maybe maybe COVID was a deliberate thing that was deliberately created, or or maybe the people who are trying to protect us know more than they're letting on, or maybe masks are responsible for COVID. Or, so all of these false pieces of missing, uh, false pieces of information were being spread in ways that clearly showed a sincere effort to make sense of what was happening, but it was rooted in this sort of deep distrust of institutions. And, and it also was tied to this, I would say an authentic curiosity of, Hey, do, do we think this could be what's going on? And so I, it reminded me in what I, how I opened the book, um, in 2006, my late husband was hospitalized with a brain tumor for, for months. And when he was first diagnosed at the end of 2005, it was so shattering to me. We had moved into a new house. We had a new baby and here was this 
totally life altering situation. The more I read about it, the more I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be devastating. Even if he survives it, our life is over as we know it. He might not be able to live unassisted. Um, and I felt out of control and I, I felt like I needed something to do and I needed a direction. And so for a short time, it was only a period of weeks, I started going down conspiracy theory rabbit holes related to the diagnosis and what could have caused it. And was he getting the right care? And is it possible they're, they're hiding things from me? And, you know, could it be an environmental issue? Well, we had just moved into the neighborhood, so that didn't make sense. And, um, trying to identify patterns where they didn't really exist. Uh, And what got me out of it was that our friend group, our friends and family who are very much artists, musicians, academics, like really loving sort of open-minded people, their focus was really like, what can I do to help Mike each day at the hospital? right? Like, can I bring music? Can I bring CDs? Um, What if I bring a puzzle for him to do? Would that be, you know, could I stay for dinner? Could I prepare him a homemade meal? Could I, and bring it to the hospital? And what they, what they gave me was a new social norm. And it told me that my conspiratorial thinking was like a violation of how we are dealing with this crisis. And it also was so important for me to remember that my late husband would never have entertained those thoughts because they're, um, they're so negative and they are, there's so much misanthropy in them. They're very much predicated on, there are people doing bad things and hiding it from you. And that was not my husband at all. So we, you know, I kind of turned it around. I left the conspiracy theories behind and and found comprehension, control, and community in new ways. And, you know, making a schedule, making sure that he was never alone at the hospital, making sure he had, you know, cozy blankets and stuffed animals and things to, to make his stay more relaxing and homey. And I wrote about this and I wrote about what conspiracy theories give us, how they really, this seems bizarre, but conspiracy theories ignite anger, but anger can feel good. Even though we think of it as a negative emotion, right? Anger is a negative emotion. Is it though? It gives you direction. It gives you purpose. And if you feel like the bottom's falling out, anger can give you optimism for the future. So I, I, I wrote about this for Vox at a very vulnerable first person essay. And the response was overwhelming that people felt that they were able to understand their conspiratorial loved ones a little better, or they themselves recognized their own conspiratorial urges and the roots of them, that it really was about trying to find control or comprehension when the unthinkable happens. Mm-hmm. And it got me thinking about the a, a new lens that I could take to this study of misinformation that I was already doing. One that was not the classic social science lens, which is I'm an objective observer of a world happening outside me, but rather, oh no, I'm a person and I'm in the world and I am myself, you know, a, you know, subjected to these same forces and dynamics. And maybe if I write in that voice and I explore these dynamics in that voice, it will be not only accessible, but it might reduce people's resistance and reduce the demonization of folks who are really just trying to do the best they can. No, and I think there's an incredible contrast between the diagram, which comes before the story, but the story comes right after the diagram. And the story is very, very vulnerable. It's very honest. And through your story, I think everybody, uh, or I, at least as this reader, thought, okay, so I am one of these people too, 
right? This is not a finger. She's not pointing fingers. She's been there and now she's trying to figure out what it looks like. And there's the model. So I, I thought those two things worked really, really well. Um, you know, and, and then you move through sort of peeling back these layers of, well, how did it happen? You know, you, you ask this question, like, how do we know what we know? Like, you, you know, we know we want to make sense of the world, but, but where did we get this information from? Um, and then you go on to, you know, how did we get so far apart? How did we get to a place in which people have such vastly different understandings of the facts? So say a little bit more about those parts um, of the book. I think that they, they're just, they're really remarkably clarifying. It, I did not think when I, when I was first starting the book, I did not think that I was going to have any section on <laughs> what's ultimately epistemology. I didn't think that that was going to be in the book. Um, but I teach our philosophy of science course for our doctoral students. Um, I teach about epistemology and I teach it in a way that makes it very digestible about the epistemology of everyday life. And I have simplified it in a way that it's we can all understand how we engage in both inductive and deductive processes every day, all the time. And so I give this example in the chapter about you get a house plant at the grocery store and you take it home and what do you do with it? Do you put it in the closet or do you put it on the windowsill? Well, you put it on the windowsill. Why do you do that? How do you know to do that? And through that example, I explore like, well, maybe you've had other house plants and you put them in the closet and they died, right? Or, and you've had houseplants that you've put in the sunshine and they've, they've thrived. Um, and, or on the other hand, maybe you've never had a plant before in your life, which is so sad because houseplants are wonderful. But maybe you've never had a houseplant, but you do remember taking classes in school and learning about something called photosynthesis. And you're like, I think I, think I should probably put it in the sun because it's a plant. Plants need sun. This is a plant. It needs sun. Well, there you have it right there. The first example is induction. The second example is deduction, right? And through that example, I also bring in questions like, what about confirmation bias? And what if what if we see what we want to see? And and what if we come to false conclusions about why it is the sun need or the plant needs to be on the windowsill? Um, and through that, I kind of walk through the logic of science. And how in the goal of science is not to prove ourselves right, but is actually to come to a closer and closer understanding of truth um, through basically a never ending process of elimination that we're always trying to break our theories. We, we have claims about the world and we're trying to test them constantly. Um, and then we set up tests and we make observations and then those observations either confirm or contradict our claim, but our claims are never proven. And I, I felt like once I had, once that was at the heart of the book, that's a wonderful little nugget to be able to come back to, because then you realize that the reason that Popper's concept of falsification is so powerful is because it is antithetical to how we live our lives. And it kind of goes against all of our instincts for survival. Because if we were all, always, trying to falsify our beliefs, we, we wouldn't make it out the door in the morning, you know? And that also, I think, reframes the issue to be like, look, it is a real luxury to be a scientist where that's what you're doing all day. But the rest of us don't have the luxury of constantly trying to break our theories. So what do we do and, and how, how, how do we make these mistakes? So in that second part about the, how, how have we gotten so far apart? You know, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of going up step by step. I'm, I'm thinking psychologically what's going on in the brain in terms of how we make and make sense of the world. And then I'm thinking sociologically how does social identity fit here? How do the groups of people that we interact with shape how we see the world? This concept of sort of social epistemology. And 
I've simplified it to, to, to the point where it really is that those three C's, comprehension, control, and community, those motivations are not realized in a vacuum. They shape what we see, sure, but where do they come from and how are they articulated? Well, they're very much informed by our team. So we want to comprehend the world the way our team does. We want to control the world in ways that are good for our team. And we want to enact community and have connections with our team. Um, so the, the book takes us sort of up these steps. I picture it as like the first step is, is individual level psychology, epistemology, this next level social identity theory. And the next piece really is, okay, so in the United States in particular, because I'm an Americanist, what is going on politically, culturally, historically, that is causing social identity to play such a central role in our politics and in our lives? And you, okay, you, you, you work very hard in the book to do two things at the same time. One is to say that this is a problem of all sides, both sides. Okay, that you know, this isn't one team that isn't is the is the the group that does this, but you also are careful to say this is not the same on both sides. So say a little bit about that balancing act that you do throughout the book, and it's hard, and I really ap appreciated it to the end of of why is this on the one hand, something true of both sides? And why is it also not true that both sides are exactly the same? Yeah, at the individual level, these dynamics themselves, the, you know, confirmation bias and, and being motivated to understand the world and control it and have community, we all engage in all of those. And all of us have our, have those motivations shaped by our social identity. The question is, for whom is social identity most salient? For whom does social identity operate in a really efficient way that it's efficiently driving these patterns? And to answer that question, I rely a lot on research from political psychology, um, the, the book Uncivil Agreement by Liliana Mason, um, and other folks working in this area who have looked at changes in our political parties over the last 40 years. And I'm not talking, there's a lot of research on how elites have changed, right? Yes, elites in Congress have become more polarized. They're less likely to compromise, et cetera, et cetera. But what's making the social identity engine run has to do with the research that shows the sociodemographic composition of the parties has changed over time in ways that have made the parties more different in terms of their the people within them. Um, social identity becomes very salient in our minds based on context, based on activation, based on how well we think we fit, right? I, I give a lot of examples of how social identity operates in more banal contexts, like when you're a fan at a football game, et cetera. Um, and my own competing social identities as, you know, someone from New Hampshire, from like rural New Hampshire, but also someone from like the, the outskirts of Philadelphia. And what accompanies those identities are also some, some political characteristics as well. And those things are often at odds, which I talk about in the book, especially when it comes to how I view the the wind turbines, the windmills that adorn the, the mountaintops in New Hampshire. I really struggle with, with where do I land on that issue? And it's very contingent on which identity is salient. Am I a New Hampshire local? Am I a, you know, progressive Philadelphian? I don't know. Um, so th the reason that I highlight those things is because you need to understand how social identity comes to be salient, how we end up putting on one hat instead of another, why we come to really define ourselves in terms of our team under what conditions. And it, it, it turns out that when we have really good fit with our team, when we look like our team, when we worship like our team worships, when we do the things our team does, when we drive the same car as our team, 
if we look and feel like our team, these pressures, these dynamics are going to operate really strongly. It is for this reason, I contend, that there is a symmetry in how we're witnessing identity-driven dynamics across the two major political parties in the United States. It is because while the Democratic Party has become more racially and ethnically diverse, more secular and agnostic, suburban and urban, and culturally liberal over the last 40 years, the Republican Party has become increasingly homogenous. It has become increasingly homogeneously white, Christian, rural, and culturally conservative. Those very well aligned identities mean that most Republicans look like most Republicans. Most Republicans worship like most Republicans. Most Republicans live in places like most Republicans. And, and what you have then is really good fit. And when you have really good fit, what's going to happen? You're going to think about yourself in terms of that team. So my sense is that that is the engine that is driving this asymmetry. And the asymmetry, the, the evidence of the asymmetry and what is going on carries throughout the whole second half of the book. All of these dynamics that we're witnessing in terms of the supply of misinformation, belief in misinformation, prevalence of misinformation is greater on the American right than on the left. Um, to me, it's not enough to just say, oh, well, they're more conspiratorial. I don't think that that's a satisfying answer. I also know, you know, work of my colleagues like Joanne Miller and Joe Yusinski and others who have looked at the relationship between conspiracism and political ideology, and they've looked at it globally. And there is not a significant association. It is conspiracism is something that the left and the right are both inclined to do when you look in a global context. In the U.S. context, that is not what's happening right now. So I argue that part of that is from these super aligned identities, which create a very efficient engine of exploitation, which is what the second half of the book deals with. There's also a really peculiar thing that happened in the U.S. with the partisan racial realignment of the parties in the 60s. So until the 1960s, the parties were quite mixed ideologically because they had basically compromised on the question of civil rights and racial justice. In the 1960s, the Democratic Party had had its hand forced by Blacks who had moved north and west from the south, who moved to northern cities and, and helped to reshape the priorities of the Democratic Party. And the Republican Party responded in kind, because now what is the pathway to legislative victory if you have those folks who maybe were more liberal on those issues who have now defected the party. Well, the plan for the, the re remaining Republicans was, was to double down on, on states' rights, but also to engage in the courtship of a kind of dormant political force, which was evangelical Christians. And we see those efforts through the 1970s as, you know, the you look at the creation of the Heritage Foundation, the conservative think tank, and, and other organizations that were really designed to unite the causes of, I would say, of, of whiteness and Christianity. And I say that because one of the examples I provide in the book is the, there were efforts by white Christian parents to kind of avoid these anti-segregation laws under Nixon. 
by sending their kids to Christian schools that just so happened to be all white. And so under the Nixon administration, their tax-exempt status was revoked. Well, that proved to be a leverageable moment. And that is what Paul Weyrich, the Heritage Foundation founder, and others saw in that moment was that you could sort of unite those causes, the, you know, the cause of evangelical Christianity and, and the desire to have a religious school schooling, but also have their children be racially segregated. Um, so I, I don't know that folks really want to talk or think too much about that, but that's very much a part of what shaped the parties. Now, what does that have to do with why things are peculiar? We now have a Republican Party that is very tightly correlated with evangelical Christianity. And Evangelical Christianity in particular is embraces a certain way of understanding the world, a very faith-based understanding of the world, a very instinct-based understanding of the world. Um, political scientists Oliver and Wood have a book called Enchanted America, where they argue that this deliberate courting of evangelical Christians by the Republican Party in the 70s is what caused us in the US to have intuitionists, that is people who value their gut and intuition as pathways to truth, they cluster on the political right in the United States. Whereas rationalists, people who value evidence and data and who wanna challenge their gut, uh, they cluster on the political left in the United States. And they, and they suggest that part of this is attributable to that that deliberate courtship because of the epistemology of evangelical Christianity. So all of those little tidbits are kind of part of the story that explains why the social identity engine, while, while the cogs in the machinery may operate on both sides, the speed with which that machinery is able to run is faster and more efficient on the political right in the U.S. than on the left. Now, many Black Americans uh, are also members of evangelical churches. So are you distinguishing a different kind of uh, philosophy within white evangelicalism than Black <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, my empirical work has not untangled that. I... I don't know if, I'm not sure how that engine operates within the black community for whom you have, you know, you know, evangelical Christian, African-Americans. I'm not sure how that engine operates. I think what's most interesting to me is that it is this sort of identity construction, this pairing of a certain genre of evangelical Christianity that is culturally conservative, white, country dwelling, you know, and it creates a bit of a caricatured image of what the appropriate way to live might be. No, and I think uh, we did Blair Kelly's book, Black Folk, uh, on the podcast a couple of months ago. And, and she's saying as well that when we say working class, we actually just mean white working class and the characteristics that we bring to it. We, we're, we're using white examples. And so it, it's hard. It's hard to unpack when a lot of the research, a lot of the history has been done in particular ways. But before we talk about the second half of the book, about the process of, of, of how all of this wrongness on the part of individuals isn't just an individual problem. It's not just that we like have them in our houses and we're wrong. We're, there's something else going on. I, I want to ask you about another one of your identities, not suburban Philadelphia or New Hampshire, but being a comic. And to, to what extent does doing improv impact how it is that you observe behavior and specifically wrongness? What I love about improv is that you cannot go into a scene with a closed mind. Um, 
if you did, you'd be, you'd be doing stand-up comedy because you don't actually have to adjust what you're doing. Um, in stand-up, you have your monologue. It is written. It is memorized. You just do it. In improv, when you get on stage and you enter a scene, you don't know where it's going. All you have is the present moment. You build on the last offer that was given and you respond to it in ways that hopefully advance the story and maybe heighten what's happening, but it's all about listening and responding only to what was just said. And so in my mind, there's a real synergy between the logic and spirit of improv and some of the concepts in the book, including like actively open-minded thinking, for example, this concept of actively open-minded thinking, which is never holding on to your beliefs or attitudes so tightly that you're unwilling to change. And, and actually not even that, I'd say it's even, it's even more aggressive than that. Actively open-minded thinking is like, yeah, I have these beliefs. Um, but I'm always looking to see if they should be updated. I'm constantly looking to see what is out there that needs to be brought to bear on those beliefs to see if they need to change. And to me, that's, that's like improv. It's like, I made an offer. I can't be so wedded to my sense of where this scene is going to go that I hijack the scene. I'm just going to make an offer but I'm going to be open. Like in my mind, like I get on stage with Alan and in my mind, I'm Alan's aunt. I haven't said that yet, but in my mind, I'm his aunt. And so here I am. And I bring this gift to him. Well, he now has signaled to me in the audience that I'm his sister. I can't be so wedded to the fact that in my mind, I was his aunt that I deny his offer because he is now just basically let everyone know I'm his sister. So I have to immediately abandon what I came to the stage with and immediately adapt and adjust. Um, It is, and it's, it's a muscle that you just practice and you use and you practice. And it really goes against what most of us are trained to do all the time, which is have our beliefs, explain to people why our beliefs are the right beliefs. Um, we're, We're not often asked to change all the time in real time. Right. And ground ourselves. Okay. So the second half of the book is, is really about what it is that happens with this, these individual instincts that you describe in the first part. And you're very focused on the media and, and how it is that these kinds of identities, this kind of identity distillation is actually reinforced and encouraged through political news, through partisan uh, media, and through social media. So say a little bit about how it is that these groups and institutions are taking something that we have an inclination towards and incentivizing it for particular use. I am a child of the 80s. And I grew up with three television stations, which seems like I'm like a relic now, right? We had Channel 4, Channel 5, and Channel 7. NBC, ABC, CBS. And it was an era of bipartisanship. It was a time when there was still relatively high trust in institutions and in media. I look at the shifts in the political environment and the media environment. And I look at the research and I look at how these relationships in terms of like media effects and exposure have changed over time. And I think there is a really delicious and devastating synergy between how our politics have changed and how our media systems have changed. So as opposed to a climate where there's three channels and really diverse membership in the parties, not so much social sorting of the parties, not as much elite polarization, today we have infinite outlets, like literally infinite outlets, Lots of t- television channels, but infinite 
outlets, social media, websites, etc. And all of that is playing out against the backdrop of political sectarianism and this social sorting. Because the logics and economics of today's media environment are predicated on creating and constructing tiny homogenous audiences that can be emotionally activated for attention and engagement. Social identity and social identity threat is the way to do that. How do you get people to pay attention and to be engaged? Well, you scare the pants off of them. You make them mad. You make them proud. You inspire them about their team identity. So here we have these increasingly distinct political parties that map onto culture and, and where we live and how we live and how we worship and what we look like. And we have this media environment that makes the most money when people are efficiently separated and emotionally activated. And I just, to me, it's devastating and fascinating because it's like a match made in heaven. However, and this is where I'm a constant optimist. Always. You are. I am a constant <laughs> optimist. You are. Because all of these dynamics are based on assumptions about what we as individuals want, what we will respond to, what it is that we are driven to pursue, we actually hold all the cards. We hold all the cards. The system operates the way it does because they are relying on patterns of behavior and attention that I don't know that we've really thought about alternative ways to challenge it. And I think as individuals, thinking about democracy-centered media engagement from what we choose to watch on TV to how we choose to express ourselves online to what we click on, if we're thinking in, in terms of what I would consider a new kind of identity, which is my identity as citizen, right? As democratic citizen, as a democratic citizen who's also assumed to be a pawn in this game, I'm going to push back against that, reclaim my role as democratic citizen and start to gum up the works of this machinery. And just summarize the, you, you, you lay out these three different ways that we really could gum up the works. And some of it comes just from us that we can just not click certain things. Just if, when you see the uh, headline in the Washington Post on your phone that frames it as the enemy versus the enemy, don't click don't don't show them that you would be interested in that try to drive try to drive them to do different kind of reporting but say say a little bit about what you want the people to do and and also what you want the platforms and journalists to do so i there are certain dynamics that i think that would be very successful and are, are structural dynamics at the level of like political elites um however the entire system right now incentivizes such bad behaviors that I don't like if I say, Oh, you know what we could do? We could like make it impossible for there to be partisan gerrymandering. Okay. Well, how's that going to happen? Or I know we could um, pass better campaign finance laws, which by the way, would totally solve a lot of these problems. Uh, but how are we going to do that right now? In this climate, we have to operate within the climate that we're in. And so the suggestions that I make at the level of journalism, number one, for journalists to stop rewarding elite displays of identity and identity threat. We know right now that political elites see it as very advantageous to perform as these ideologically extreme um, exemplars of their parties because they make the news. They just, they just do. I have a whole section about the um, Justice um, Jackson hearings and the behaviors. 
Yeah, thank you. And the behaviors of of like Josh Hawley and, and Ted Cruz that many were like, oh, gosh, this is so over the top. And it's so like culture war divisive. They were rewarded and they just they weren't just rewarded on Fox. They were rewarded across the mainstream news outlets. And what really shocked me, they were especially rewarded by MSNBC. So liberal and conservative partisan media, their bread and butter is identity threat. And that but it's not. It, yeah. like, sorry to interrupt you. I think in some way it's not shocking because uh, of the model that you've put forward. If I'm trying to uh, garner support for my MSNBC team, then showing the opposition to be uh, it, unintelligent or ranting or behaving in exactly the way we have said they behave, which distinguishes them from us, makes a lot of sense. Nevertheless, it's feeding these flames. And and one of the things I love in the book is that you know at just at the moment where uh, you're saying like, well, maybe the newspapers could decide not to do this, and I'm thinking like that'll never happen. You say, well, but it did happen. Like back at a time during some of the most controversial and, uh, you know, cutthroat newspapering, it did happen. And so that's a lovely way that in which you sort of show that we've have, we've have had this experience of people laying down and making, doing something for the good of the country. And what you see in those sections when I do this sort of back and forth, it's me. It's my own voice in my head. As I finish this section, I'm like, Dana, this is never going to happen. And I'm like, no, but Dana, it did happen. It happened, right? After the Spanish-American War and after the yellow journalism crisis, when the American Association of Newspaper Editors said, we're going to a dark place fast. And if we don't get our act together, democracy is going to suffer. And so we need to establish canons of journalism that are going to define what constitutes uh, journalism in the service of the public good. And they did it. Um, so so in journalism, I think that there are, are things that could be done in terms of reducing that left versus right strategy and conflict framing, um, taking a focus that is more institution and citizen-based is so much better for democratic health rather than focusing just on the spectacle of, of elites. The spectacle of elites is titillating, sure, but what actually helps citizens might be slightly less titillating. Um, and folks will say, but the market won't reward it. The market you know, will, will, will punish that kind of content. Well, guess what? That is why I also call for expansion of a robust public media infrastructure, Um, a robust independent public media infrastructure, which there is evidence from, you know, there's global evidence that our strongest democracies around the globe are places that have robust independent public media infrastructures. When you grow up in the United States, you do not even understand how bizarre our media system is in terms of the tiny number of people consuming public media. Public media in most places, in most healthy democracies, is the backbone of their democratic information system. And the reason that it is able to be that is because it is not subject to these pressures. It is not part of the attention economy. It is not part of the outreach economy. It is allowed to be a little more measured, et cetera. And that builds credibility and trust. In terms of the crisis that our media institutions are in, what we don't know is how a pub, an independent, publicly funded media system might be a little more resilient in terms of those trust metrics. Um, I also talk a lot about local journalism. Local journalism and especially local community, independent community newspapers are where American citizens are able to cultivate a civic identity that is not connected to party. It's a civic identity that's connected to community that's connected to being a part of of a a civic community. Um, So investment in in local journalism is another one of the solutions. And in terms of the social media platforms, what I'm calling for is so what everyone is calling for because it really is the answer and it's so obvious. And I almost feel embarrassed that's 
that it's all that I recommend. And it simply is <laughs> transparency, transparency in terms of algorithms, transparency in terms of ad targeting, transparency in order to facilitate counter speech, right? If there is some organization that has purchased a, a tiny targeted ad we should be able to assess what that is, who bought it, and who saw it so that we can expose those people to counter speech. That is part of the transparency requirement. And the second one is just, goodness gracious, Meta, Twitter, X, whatever you call yourselves. Social scientists, data scientists need access to anonymized data sets, full stop. We need we need access to anonymized data sets without having our hands tied behind our backs. Um, and at the individual level, some of the solutions that I mentioned to you earlier, Susan, I, and I think when I talk about individual level solutions, I don't want to be burdensome to people, but I think that a lot of folks are like, well, what can I do? What are things I can do to disrupt identity-driven wrongness? And the answer is find ways to have those dominant mega identities become less salient in your life. Um, that doesn't mean be less interested in politics. That doesn't mean be less interested in public policy. What it means is allowing, first of all, being intellectually humble. That is always being willing to update your views or update your perceptions of reality based on new information, acknowledging there, that we are all fallible and there are limits to what we know. And so we never remove ourselves from doubt. That's one. Um, but also recognizing that in spite of the social sorting that we have witnessed in the United States, in spite of the fact that you might think that this caricatured person that you think is a flaming liberal lefty, just because they have all of these identities that align, just because they dress a certain way or drive a certain car, or, or well, for the liberal lefty, they would ride a bicycle. Just because of that does not mean that we know what their nuanced positions are on public policy. And in fact, when you look at Americans' opinions on the specifics of public policy, it is far more complex and nuanced than any of the nationalized culture war conversations would ever lead you to believe. And that means that you should always make a seat at the table. You should always invite a conversation. You should never assume that someone is, your, is in your out group. And we also owe it to our information environment to be honest and disruptive in our own performances of identity. There are a lot of pressures to perform online in accordance with our team. I think we have been witnessing this in a really concentrated way over the last several weeks in particular. I think we owe it to ourselves and our community to be honest in our self-presentation. If you hold a view that doesn't happen to comport to the views of your team, throw it out there. Say, you know, I'm not totally sure, but here are some things that I've been thinking about. You may be, you know, punished for that. Folks may chime in and say that you're a big fat dummy, but think about how valuable, how valuable it is for you to throw a wrench in the works in that way. Because all of us are contributing to the political information environment. We're not just consuming information, we're all producing information. So we can be active disruptors of what that information environment looks like. So before we say goodbye, I have two kind of, and, and thank you for that, because that's a, that's a, I appreciate that this book does not look away from ugly things and really puts us in that mess, right? As opposed to sort of separating yourself. But I also do appreciate that the conclusion has constructive and positive ways, small and big, that, that we could tackle this. Uh, okay, a couple of things. First of all, so did you find any differences in 
gender with regard to comprehending or feeling in control? Is there some sort of particular identity that makes it a little easier not to be wrong? And the and the other question is uh, sort of has to do with where you were going a few minutes ago. Is there an outlet that you can think of, not that I'm having you pick and choose a particular one, that is, in fact, giving us democracy-centered political information that isn't local? I really loved your description of regional and local newspapers. I thought it was spot on that this is the space in which we all just want the library to be redone, and so we're not fighting about the curriculum. I thought that was beautiful. But is there a space either on the internet, a newspaper, anything where you think like, well, here's good national coverage that maybe gets us a little closer to to it? That is a great, great question. Um, Sometimes I will share examples of what I think is online. I'll share examples of coverage that I think is done very, very well that will relegate those identity, those elite identity displays to like a footnote. Um, I don't know that there is a specific outlet that is doing it well. You know, New York Times and Washington Post sometimes do it well. Sometimes they're the biggest violators of all. Sometimes I read a headline and I want to throw something against the wall, but it's what I'm holding is my phone and I don't want to break my phone. So I don't do that. Um, you know, NPR is an interesting example because NPR is, it doesn't have those same pressures for profit, although it obviously does have pressures for listenership, right? Because it it is, we, we call it public media, but it really is supporter, supporter funded. Um. But I think that a lot of times I find that what they do is, you know, it's, it's pretty good in terms of not always focusing on the conflict and, and delving deep into issues at the level of institutions and processes, but they still do a hefty amount of strategy and conflict framing of, of political news. Um, I don't, I don't know, Susan. I don't know. I do. I, every once in a while, I find an example of something done well, uh, but not all the time. Actually, I think that's an incredibly helpful answer, Dana. I, I, because I think that I do think it's helpful because I think that it's, it's true. I, I, I listen to a ton of NPR. I consume a lot of, uh, of newspapers and BBC. And, and I think that yes, NPR sometimes does exactly what you're asking for, more of a focus on policy, because if you focus on the actual policy, then you're not, you're framing it substantively and you're framing it in terms of what is the effect this is going to have on voters. I, I do some local television here and the host always says in her notes to me, please emphasize the effect this will have on the people of Philadelphia, Delaware and and and, and New Jersey. And I have this kind of like, okay, yeah, how does the infrastructure bill do this? Like, forget about who's voting for it, but, you know, why is Delaware in a different situation with regards to the internet than New Jersey is? Okay, this is good. This is an interesting way to come at it. And I think it's maybe useful to say all of the newspapers are not terrible. They have terrible moments. And and the question is, what do we do with those terrible moments? And I like your idea of positively sharing when it when they do it well, because when you chastise them for doing it poorly, what you're doing is what you referred to earlier with the Ted Cruz moments. You're amplifying the bad and saying, like, look how dumb this was, as opposed to amplifying the good. So I I actually really think that that's Although useful. I- I mean, I'll be honest though, Susan, because I do both and, and I do both. And I, and it's a little bit different. I think when, if I screenshot a really reprehensible headline from the Washington post and I share that, um, I do think that the people at those institutions really want to do what's best. I, I think that they are very democracy mind, democratically minded. I think that they get in their own way. A lot of times, I think that there are norms and routines that get in their way, as opposed to somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene. If a newspaper does a a hit piece about her, she her whole brand is that she's anti-media and media is anti her. And so she can use that piece to sort of leverage that that brand identity even more. 
Whereas I, I do think that you're, I don't think that national journalists want to be called out for being potentially harmful to democratic health. That is my sense, truly. I've had some very, very good exchanges with folks um, from CNN and and from some of the legacy press when I call them out and I say, I'm disappointed to see this. Here's what we know this does. The empirical work suggests that this will foster cynicism, reduce trust, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes I get a direct message that says, so it's, it's a little defensive, but like, so what do you suggest I should do instead? I'm like, okay, I actually have an answer to that, you know? Um, oh, great. That's hopeful. It okay. is hopeful. It that's is hopeful. hopeful. All right. That's a great way for us to end. Uh, thank you so much for writing this book. It's, uh, I have to say, it's one that has uh, changed me a little bit. And, uh, and I thought I was doing well, but this was a very revealing book. And I really welcome uh, people to assign this book. This is a very easy to assign book for undergraduates or graduate students. The, the, the research is all there, but it's also a very clearly presented non-jargony book. Uh, it's intended for any reader in any background. Nobody needs to be a political scientist or a communication specialist or a social psychologist. So uh, we've been talking about Dr. Young's book, Wrong, How Media, Politics, and Identity Drive Our Appetite for Misinformation. It's from John Hopkins University Press. We have a link on the show notes. And Dana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Susan. This was really delightful.